you know, when you look at health and wellness and you look at connected devices and IoT and smart home devices, there's a huge opportunity to use all of that technology, not just for comfort and not just for convenience and not just for the latest cool toy. I'm a gadget geek, so, you know, I love that. Um, but to help people, like, and that's, that's where this whole thing started. It's like, why can't we, as an, as an industry of people who do consumer electronics and smart home devices, use this to help people um, live better, live health, healthier, live longer in their homes, live more independently. Hi, my name is Robert Schmidt. I'm Deloitte's Chief IoT Technologist, also known as Mr. IoT. Welcome to my weekly show, Coffee with Mr. IoT. And my guest today is Michael Maniscalco. How did I do with the name? Perfect, you nailed it. Awesome. Welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. You are the CEO and founder of Better Living Tech. That's right. Um, tell us about what your company does and I actually really want to encourage you, maybe you can also tell us how it started because I think there's a really great personal story behind it. Yeah, I love it. It makes it easy to tell. So um, the backstory is my career has been in IoT and, and smart home. So that's where I've spent most of my career, uh, including some technologies for remote monitoring. Um, so that, that was my day job for a long time. I had two startups in that space. Uh, but if you rewind about three years, not quite three years ago, my son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So when that happened, um, kind of changed our lives quite a bit. Um, How old is he? He was 18 months old. So, he was 18 yeah. months old. So his name's Zach, and he was 18 months, so the entire burden falls on you as a parent, right? Um, and didn't honestly didn't know anything about diabetes, so this was um, a learning experience. And uh, about 30 days into it, you know, we were learning, and I wasn't sleeping. And um, I said, this is insane. There's no way I can do this for another 20 plus years. Um, we've got to find a better way to do this. So I started digging into the tech, and as a techie, as a computer science background, like I have that luxury. Um, you know, I have that privilege is the way I look at it. And I started applying what I know, and that's smart home and remote monitoring, to can I help my, my son, and can I help myself sleep? Uh, and what I ended up doing was connecting his continuous glucose monitor, which is a, a patch that goes on his arm, basically monitors his blood sugar 24 hours a day, and uh, sends that through Bluetooth to a phone, which relays that to the cloud. So I'm like, well, we have a data point in the cloud on his blood sugar every five minutes. What if I connect that to my smart home system so that if overnight his blood sugars go too low, which can cause complications and death, and it's scary, it's a, it's a stressor. If those blood sugar numbers go too low, it triggers alerts through my smart home system, just like an, a home alarm system I do. Um, this was three, three in the morning, and I'm sitting there looking at my wall switch, and I said, this is totally possible, and I, I did it. Um, so that's, the, that's where I started on this journey, is like trying to help this pain point I had. And as I, once I had the data in the cloud, I was like, where else can I distribute that data to help manage my son? So I ended up connecting it to watches, phones, laptops, Alexa, smart fridges, you know, anywhere and everywhere I could get the data. It brought this concept of just glanceability to it. Um, so that I could go about my day and kind of work un uninterrupted and be productive at work, things like that. Um, and that's how I started with this whole thing, is just a, a personal experience. And you know, out of a, I think an unfortunate event came some, some new opportunities to help other people. So I find this, um, it's a really touching story, thanks for sharing that. Um, I get it, why you would go there, right? How did you find out that an 18 months old has diabetes? I, I'm curious to learn. <laughs> it's a loaded question. <laughs> because okay. I, yeah, I, so we have um, triplets. So we have oh, a, okay. Zach is one of a set of triplets. So he's got okay. two siblings that live and breathe the same you know, diets and environment every day. And Zach was always a little bit different. And some of the signs of type 1 diabetes, and this is great for like advocacy and education, are um, a lot of water drinking. So his first word was agua. Um, oh, really? And he was just, he had an insatiable thirst. So always water all night long. And then obviously overnight that causes him to, you know, wet a little more than normal. Um, he would get, the technical term I would put around it is hangry, um, sure. when he was hungry. I and have that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, we all do. Um, but with type 1 it's pronounced because sure. your body isn't able to absorb those carbs for energy. So you're, get, you're generally hungry. 
Um, and then he had this double fisting, just eating. He had very different eating habits from his siblings. So you put so you those had a clear together. comparison. These yeah, you put like those together. Zach, and, you're like, and then you had his two off. siblings. Oh, yeah. So that's how we did it. And luckily, we caught it. it. Wasn't a traumatic event for us. We caught it early, because of this, you know, uh, atypical situation we're in with the triplets. So, so what fast? Thank you. It's really great. I think it's helpful not just for me, for for the listeners and the watchers too. So. I have to say what also occurred to me while you were telling the story, which fascinates me, is you were in smart homes. There is lots and lots of smart homes applications out there. And you had to build smart health in order, because smart homes was ahead of smart health. What's up with that? I mean, does that make yeah. any sense what I'm saying? It's yeah. sort of really interesting to me that we do less with health and connected uh, people than we do with our homes. Is yeah. that true? I mean, I, th I think that's still true. I think that the consumer electronics industry is, has led for a long time around IoT. And th what's interesting is the number of interfaces, the number of sensors, uh, the reliability of all these consumer electronic connected devices has become so great that it's opened up applications around health and wellness that weren't available 10 years ago. They were just too expensive and, and um, the interfaces and devices didn't exist. So I think that's one of the reasons that it's lagging. But you know, when you look at health and wellness and you look at connected devices and IoT and smart home devices, there's a huge opportunity to use all of that technology, not just for comfort and not just for convenience and not just for the latest cool toy. I'm a gadget geek, so you know I love that. Um, but to help people, like, and that's that's where this whole thing started. It's like, why can't we, as an as an industry of people who do consumer electronics and smart home devices, use this to help people um, live better, live help, healthier, live longer in their homes, live more independently? So yes, I, I I would say it does it does lag, but it's catching up quickly. Interesting. So. Are the sensors there today? Because I know you said you need. There was a sensor that was attached to Zach, and that gave the information to you. So the sensors exist today. We're at the. I would say it's, we're still at the early point of the sensors. Um, this is something I learned through just going to you know, kind of crashing diabetes conferences for a couple of years after <laughs> he was diagnosed, and just listening to the scientific presentations. Uh, type one diabetes actually leads this industrial IoT around healthcare adoption. So. The continuous glucose monitor that he wears, this is a new technology. It's just getting to the point where it's as accurate as a finger prick to check your blood sugar, okay. right? Um, and they're becoming calibrationless is the word they use. So you don't have to prick your finger a few times a day to calibrate it. So nobody likes pricking the finger. So this is happening in the type 1 diabetes space. Uh, but then w what happened a few years ago is they put a Bluetooth um, uh, transmitter and they put a battery on these devices and they can broadcast that in real time to a receiver. And the next evolution was that, well, let's create an app that's FDA approved that allows us to capture that data, send it to the cloud and allow people to follow it remotely. So it's, this device is actually leading the way from a medical device IoT perspective on what you can do with medical devices to monitor people um, in near real time. And you're seeing this trend in the insulin pumps happening as well. So a lot of the people with type 1 diabetes wear insulin pumps that dose their insulin constantly. Well, if you can now connect that to the network and extract data from that, um, you get more context on what's going on with this insulin information, with this carbohydrate information, um, which is, I think shows what we can do with medical devices for remote monitoring. It's this, and that's where my remote monitoring technology of the past kind of comes into play in this remote patient monitoring equation. So is it true, my understanding is that the monitoring and the, um, the insulin pump, they aren't really, they're still human intervention required because otherwise the approval processes are different and so forth. Is that true? How does that work? It is true. So in type 1 diabetes specifically, there are just so many different factors that impact your blood sugars. Like the, 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 the big ones are carbohydrate intake. Cause that's, makes your blood sugar go high, your body can't process their, their carbohydrates, the sugars anymore. Um, and then there's the insulin, which brings your, which offsets the carbohydrates and brings your blood sugar down to regulate it. You know, a normal, healthy individual, their body self-regulates that. Um, but with diabetes, you are counteracting the carbs with insulin constantly. So you are interacting with it. But there are something like 42 other factors, so stress and hormones and um, activity and sleep and all these things impact blood sugars. So it is still, there's still quite a bit of manual interaction. And there's a trend to what they call closing the loop um, and basically connecting the blood sugar data to the medical device so that it can, based on rates of change and insulin that's active in your body and carbohydrates, do some simple, well, 
do some math um, and determine where that's going to go, and then maybe automate the insulin delivery. Dose the insulin yeah, just automatically, like a, right? But just it like doesn't happen today, right? Is that what your company tries to do, close the loop? We're not, we're not trying to close the loop. We're looking at um, helping reduce the stress, anxiety, and burden around the disease by getting better access to that disease information. Um, so to give you an example, uh, I've connected his blood sugar data to a couple of smart lights. And yeah, I saw that yeah. on Twitter. You had it on yeah. Twitter. That was really cool. And, uh, you know, I think that it, this is iteration, right? There are small things we can do that can make big differences in people's lives. And I think things like the cure and automated insulin delivery are the future, but they are longer term um, okay. technologies. So I'm focused on what can we do to help people in this situation today. And we're mainly going to market focus on the parents of children kind of in the situation I was in, helping them reduce some of the stress and anxiety to sleep better. Like, it's huge. Uh, so I've connected the blood sugar data to these smart lights as secondary interfaces and alerting interfaces. And just like my story that I told you when we started, um, can we help people sleep at night by connecting that blood sugar data to an alert light that may turn on and help them wake up and augment their audible alarm they may have? Or can you connect that to Alexa? And for the other light that I've created actually changes colors based on his blood sugars all day. So based on the range of his blood sugar, it'll go from green to red to yellow to orange. And all day, I'm just watching this little light on my desk at work change. It just naturally sits there. It's like my son's sitting there next to me at work, and I'm watching. It's, it's really <laughs> an odd emotional connection that I've kind of created with, created that light. with this light over, over nine months. Um, but what, what's you, here like, with you now? I mean, you have no light here. How do you yeah. know now? So I, I've taken it a little further for my own personal use, and I've leveraged a lot of the work. There's a whole open source, DIY maker, like dads like me who have technical skills who just said, you know, we can do these things. So I've started, I've basically leveraged a lot of the work they've done and I've connected it to my watch. We can look at oh, so the on your watch. on my watch, it's on my phone, it's Is on my doing laptop. Okay? He was a little dicey when we came in. Um, <laughs> he's doing better now, he's kind of leveled out and he's about to eat lunch. Uh, okay. So, but I just, you know, I have all that on the top of my head and we're having this conversation uninterrupted. So. It's been a huge relief. So that's that's the goal of what we're doing is how do we provide this disease data in more accessible interfaces with more context to help provide some relief. And the science behind that, you know, there's a lot of studies around the stress and anxiety and the behavioral side of diabetes that doesn't get a lot of attention. So that's where we're focused. So uh, you talk about how you feel better knowing what goes on with Zach and so forth. How does Zach feel being sort of like your patient one, if you yeah. wish? <laughs> It's, um, I mean, I, I guess he's now, what, four and a half? He's four and a half, and I, I don't think he knows. It's just... I For him, that's it, just life. It allows me... He, he doesn't know any better. And I, when I talk to other parents, I mean, it, the stories are always hard. And you talk to other parents about when their kids were diagnosed, and I've continuously come to the same conclusion is that there's just no good time. Because if he's young, he knows no better. If he's a teenager, he's a teenager. He's fighting all the things in life that a teenager does. Now he's got diabetes involved. Um, if they're a, an older adult, because diabetes isn't just, doesn't just uh, affect children, but it also happens, for, happens in older adults or young adults, you've created a lifelong set of habits. Um, so that, I don't know, the, the long answer is there's no good age for diagnosis. And for him, um, he, doesn't, he doesn't know any better, and I think this allows me to spend better time with him and allows him to live a more normal life. And we inter inter interact with him when he needs it around the diabetes data and not constantly like hovering over him you know, worried, and that's, when you look at other parents who don't have solutions like this, it, in a lot of cases, can take over the family's life, and it just changes it, and I want to help people live norm more normally. I have to say, as a father of two boys, in, uh, 19 and 22 now, I don't even know how I would deal with triplets, leave alone with one of them having uh, diabetes, so. Yeah, triplets and then <laughs> diabetes in a startup, it's like, I, yeah. Uh, so you are a startup. We're here at Capital Factory today uh, filming. Thank you to Capital Factory for having us. What's your relationship with Capital Factory? Tell us, tell us a little bit about your startup and um, how is that going? Yeah, so um, Capital Factory is uh, an accelerator and co-working space in Austin. And they've been around their 10th anniversary is coming up. So um, Capital Lab Factory was one of the things that when we were located from South Florida to Austin 10 years ago, so we talked to Capital Factory, or looked at the ecosystem they were building. We talked to ATI, which is the Austin Technology Incubator at University of Texas, and they were really the organization that recruited us to Austin. Um, and then why uh, didn't you go to California for? Our, I mean, all places. It was it was a hard decision. Yeah, we looked at all the all the cities you'd expect, right around the country. Um, and with ATI here in Austin and the things happening, 
the cost of labor then was just it was it was okay. a it was a really good place to do business. It's changed over the last ten years. And I, some for the some for the better. Some some has been harder. Um, but Austin was just a really good place for us to end up, and I'm really happy. The quality of life, plus the career opportunities and this, the ecosystem that's here, is pretty amazing. And Capital Factory is a big part of that ecosystem, as is ATI. So my last company went through ATI Capital Factory, um, and then we sold that in 2017 to a company called Control Four, who's one of the biggest smart home um, manufacturers, I guess, out there. Uh, so I had this opportunity to do do this new startup and got it started about a year ago through the Techstars Social Impact Accelerator. So Techstars is another accelerator, it's a more of a global accelerator, and they had their inaugural social impact class starting in Austin in June of 2018. Um, so as I got to know their team, and that really aligned with what I wanted to do, like make, make an impact in people's lives and, and do this for, for the better. Um, I started with the, that program, it got me a great kind of running start, was the catalyst in, in the true sense of getting the company started. Uh, and then kind of moved into, as that cadence of that program wrapped up, uh, moved into Capital Factory to continue the support of the mentors and advisors here. So Capital Factory's got a good presence in Austin. It's really interesting for me, right? So I spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley. And uh, coming here to Austin, I always enjoy it. There's sort of a very, it still has a different vibe. It still has a vibe of a younger, sort of like the... The Silicon Valley culture is uh, it's a little different now with some of them having grown up so big like, you know, the Googles and the Facebooks of the world, right? Y you still have a bit of a young vibe here and I really enjoy that, so it's great to be here. So I'm curious, we talked about digital health, we talked about um, how you started in smart home. Um, I gotta ask you, your house, having grown up in smart home, <laughs> tell me about your place, it's gotta be amazing. It's, you know, I. As a as a geek, or did like, you go the it, other extreme? It, uh, um, I as a geek, I like to play with the newest toys, right? So it's kind of a Frankenstein's monster of like <laughs> you know, a mix mash of, of technology. Um, I have this fantastic high end home automation equipment that kind of I hate to say it collects dust in the attic because okay. I just constantly like to play with the new the new toys and and see how it works and. It, you know, the experiment actually worked out well. It's what got me here. Um, it was, can I use a entry-level home automation system to build an application um, that could potentially impact somebody's not only psychosocial levels like stress and anxiety and, and you know, psychological burdens, um, but potentially, like, if we take this down a regulatory path in the future, save lives. Uh, that was an experiment, and having this collection of equipment allowed me to run that experiment yeah, in my own. Uh, in my what own, is the latest toy you brought home? Oh man, the word I—that's—that's that's a hard one to answer. <laughs> I'll have to think about it for a second. I've got—I really like the streaming set-top boxes and the and the TVs. I think that that connectivity being in every room just changes the entertainment experience. Mm -hmm. And I think there are also some applications where you can interact with people on those those TV sets around health and wellness to nudge them um, if things are out of whack for for diabetes or if they're just trying to to have a stand-up goal. Um, can you use those interfaces to do better things? Yeah, I, think I just stopped doing streaming set-top boxes. I just use streaming services to stream the content to me. I don't even store it anymore anywhere. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, so it's a, uh, you know, the, the cameras are another one that I really, I really like. Um, having cameras around the house, especially when we're traveling, is handy. Uh, and I think that those have some great applications. If you can, a lot of this health and wellness category, there are a lot of privacy concerns. So I think when you, when you think about cameras in people's homes and using it for a caregiver, of, of whether it's a family member or a paid caregiver to support somebody, you have to think about the privacy impact. Um, but if you're able to mask some of the, the private, mask some of the interactions in the home, so IR or maybe LIDAR in the home, like taking this camera component and then allowing that to be used to monitor people in their homes where it's not as invasive, I think has a lot of promise. Um, so even though I use the cameras for security, I always think about can this be used for peace of mind and helping people live better? So I would say that's another, another area I play around with. Closing question for you. Um, what can we, as people that work with and around the healthcare industry, do to really help you uh, move the needle? I mean, I really admire your social impact um, inspiration and your uh, goals around this. What do you find that we, the uh, regular people out there, do to help that? Um, I think spreading the word is definitely a, a, a big part of it because you are, 
you know, the, the way that care is delivered and the way that people managing diseases, it's changing, um, especially with telemedicine and these remote monitoring components and um, people being empowered to take control of their own situation a little more. Uh, so there's a lot of education and, and awareness about what are the latest ways that people are using technology to manage that disease. And it's hard for the system because the doctors in a lot of cases are stressed. They're, you know, they're, they're overworked and understaffed. Um, so are they, they willing to adapt that tech? Do you find that doctors are really wanting it? I think that they realize that there's benefits, so they embrace that. But for them to take time out of their daily practice to keep up on all the tech, you know how quickly technology changes. So right? for a doctor to do that and maintain his practice and deliver care and keep up to date on the latest medicine is a lot to ask. So you know, spreading the word about the newest um, technologies isn't always the easiest through the doctor. So just getting it out to the industry and the community is a big part of it and, and letting people know there are different ways to interact with the data. Um, so me as a patient, spread the word and uh, uh, be open to technology. Um, work with the doctor to help the doctor and actually own my own information too. I think I heard you say that in yeah. some form or fashion. Yeah. Um, so take control of my disease in a way. And I think think about the consumer experience. Think about the patient experience. I think in the, in the healthcare space, this. It's not always a priority. Um, so I think there's huge opportunities to improve the experience around the devices, around the software, around the interactions. Um, be more thoughtful in the way you interact with people, like align with their goals. Um, and that may change. Their goal today might not be the same t tomorrow. So can you create a better experience to support people like that? Um, those are the opportunities I think technology and software can really make an impact in healthcare. So when are we going to see the first product from Better Living? We just opened our beta and this month. So you can actually now purchase the product on our website. Um, and this is our first version of the product. We have lots of other things. We want and it's to only do. for diabetes 1? Only for, uh, well, it's anybody who wears a continuous glucose monitor oh, okay. could, could potentially adopt the technology. But continuous glucose monitor technology has not become a, a standard of care in type 2 diabetes yet. But it's coming quickly. Got it. So most of our most of our families are type one. So beta is available. Own my te own my own disease and spread the word. Is that That's what right. I heard? That's right. That's awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And with that, uh, we've come to the end of. Uh, this coffee chat. Uh, thank you for being here and uh, please don't forget to subscribe up there and uh, check out our show um, on YouTube if you missed any of today or any past shows. Have a good one. Bye.